Thank you all. Yeah, thank you all for coming, Margaret. Thank you for the introduction. Laura, um, kind of reliving the old days, aren't we? Uh, I'm, for a baseball guy, I was going to say a baseball nut, but for a baseball fan, it's a thrill for me to uh, share the stage with the commissioner. Uh, I'm, uh, I really believe the owners made a really wise choice in picking Rob uh, as the new commissioner of baseball. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, I do want to thank Alan Lowe and Amy Polly for uh, setting up this fantastic exhibition. It's, it's great, and I think the people who come are going to be enthralled. Uh, Rob, I'm really glad that you brought Colleen with you, the first lady of baseball. Uh, I am, uh, want to thank our sponsors like Margaret did as well. I do want to give a shout out to some of the baseball people who are here. Uh, Laura and I had a, a glorious time uh, when we were in the game, and we made a lot of good friends, and I'm honored that so, so many came. Uh, a non-current owner, but someone who's got a huge name in baseball is Peter O'Malley of the L.A. Dodgers. And Peter, thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, my longtime friend, mighty Chicago White Sox owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, who's uh, been very instrumental in the development of the game, and we're thrilled you're here, Jerry. Thank you for coming. <laughs> of the Atlanta Braves, the great Bill Bartholomew. Bill, thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here. Uh, from the St. Louis Cardinals, as much as I hate to bring them up after game six of the World Series, <laughs> Uh, Bill and Kathy DeWitt and our relatives who are part owners of the Cardinals, the, uh, Craig and Debbie Stapleton are here. Welcome to, the, welcome to Dallas. <laughs> and of course, the mighty Rangers. Did you grow up as a baseball fan? Grew up as a baseball fan. Um, did you I grew have up a in favorite upstate. team? I'm sorry? Did you have a favorite team? I did. I grew up a Yankee fan. Um, we had cable television early <laughs> in upstate New York. <laughs> yeah, good, Rob. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Texas anyway. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what would you say are the goals? If you were sitting in front of the owners and listed the three most important goals during your tenure, what would, what would you tell them? Well, I think the first and most important goal is to pass our game on to a new generation of fans. It's a huge challenge for us. Um, young people have so many entertainment alternatives out there. I think that we need to work very hard um, to make sure that what has always been the generational aspect of baseball, fathers to sons, mothers to daughters, continues. Um, secondly, I think we have a challenge in terms of attracting the best athletes to the game. Uh, we need to be more diverse. Uh, we need to work very hard uh, to make sure that we continue to have the kind of athletes like Andrew McCutcheon, um, Clayton Kershaw that we have out, uh, out there today. Dallas boy. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I'm doing better than the Yankees yes. right now. <laughs> so, and then the third thing, I, I, I think we have to um, adjust to what is a quickly changing media landscape. Um, the way that people consume content is changing very quickly, and I think we're well positioned to do that with MLB Advanced Media, but it is going to be a challenge for us going forward. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure you've analyzed this. Why uh, we don't get more African Americans to play baseball? I think that um, it began with a problem of facilities in the inner city. Uh, it, you know, baseball is not the easiest game to play. Um, you do need a adequate facilities to attract people. And I think uh, the competition from both basketball and football is fierce. Uh, we get hurt because for both basketball and football, you have the opportunity to get a full scholarship to college. Uh, parents look at that and they see it as an opportunity. Uh, college baseball is a little different. They don't have the same kind of scholarships available. And I think we get hurt in that space. Instant replay. I mean, it's a game of tradition, right? It is. Instant a game replay is not very traditional. Uh, has it worked? Will it be expanded? I'm a fan of instant replay. Um, I think whenever 
we take on a project that affects the game on the field, we're trying to balance two things. The desire to modernize the game, be responsive to what we hear from fans on the one hand, and then of course on the other hand, not disrupting the history and traditions of the game. Uh, we always rely on people with lots of on-field experience. When we make changes like replay, it was a long process with a lot of testing before we jumped into it. But I thought last year, largely because of the great technology that was involved, that instant replay was a success. Um, it, it didn't really materially lengthen the games. Uh, you know, about 45% of the calls that were challenged were overturned, which means that we corrected some calls that mattered. Um, and other than the catch-no-catch -catch problem that we had at the beginning of the year, we didn't have uh, a lot of difficulties with it. Uh, how are the Rangers going to do this year? <laughs> what I can tell you about that is this. I talked to Ray Davis before, and he seems to have great confidence. So, um, <laughs> there is a young African-American girl that got a lot of publicity recently for her pitching. Right. Um, is it inconceivable that a, a woman uh, would ever be able to breakthrough into baseball in the, at the national level? Let me tell you a little story about the um, young woman you're talking about. Her name is Monet Davis. Um, I, I actually went to Williamsport shortly after the election and um, had an opportunity to meet Monet, and I had to throw out a first pitch. And then she threw the first pitch in the game right afterwards. And given the comparison of those two things, I, I have to say, I think it is possible that there would be a woman that, that, that could, you know, be good enough to participate at the major league level. Um, this young woman is amazingly athletic. Um, she looked right at me when I met her and uh, I said, you know, it's just unbelievable what you've accomplished here this summer. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I like baseball all right, but I'm going to play basketball for UConn. <laughs> Are there women umpires? In the minor leagues? We have some women umpires in the minor leagues. Um, you know, minor league umpiring is a very difficult job. It's, it's actually harder to get to the big leagues as an umpire than it is to get there player. as a player. You know, our umpires tend to work a very long time once they get there. And um, it, it is an issue. Um, the, the length of time that it takes is an issue in terms of promoting diversity, both gender and race. Yeah. Should uh, Barry Bonds or somebody like Barry Bonds be in the Hall of Fame? You know, I think the players um, who've been involved with steroids, you have to divide them in, in, into different groups. Um, players who've tested positive or have otherwise been proved to use steroids, um, I, I think that um, Getting them into the Hall of Fame is going to be a very, very difficult thing um, with the current set of writers that we have. What I, get con what I do get concerned about, and I'm comfortable with that. I mean, I understand why people have that reluctance. What I get concerned about is players where they never tested positive, they were never proved to have used in, in, in a legal proceeding of any type, but people looked at them and said, you know, he looked like a steroid user. You know, I spent a lot of time on steroids. There's no such thing as he looked like a steroid user. I mean, you just can't. You've been on steroids? <laughs> yeah. Do you I don't look, look like, like I a was steroid there. user? Yeah, right. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I see what you're saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Pete Rose. He didn't use steroids, but... Uh, I'm sure this issue will come to your desk. As a matter of fact, the reason I'm asking is, I think you're already public on the issue. I read, read right. something about That's it. That's correct. Uh, so what's the state of play there? Um, Pete Rose and his representatives um, filed um, a request for reinstatement, which was their right under the agreement that he negotiated with Commissioner Giamatti. Um, what I've said publicly about that is I'm going to um, be in touch with his representatives. We'll agree on a process for handling his request. Uh, I was not involved in the, the, the Rose matter when it originally um, happened, so I'm going to need to get up to speed on it. But we'll agree on a process that allows me to get familiar with all the facts, gives Pete an opportunity to be heard, and then I'll do what I think the Major League Constitution requires. I'll make a decision. Baseball. Why don't you share with everybody the difference between scholarships in college for college baseball and scholarships for football? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, 
I, I like numbers, they always stick in my head. You know, in, in football and basketball, virtually everyone at a Division I school who plays on a team is on a full scholarship. In contrast, a college baseball team cannot have more than 11.7 scholarships. I've never been able to get anybody to explain to me exactly where that point seven comes from and, and why, why it matters. But so what happens is um, if you have a three sport athlete um, in high school, uh, he often has an opportunity to play college basketball or college football on a full ride and almost nobody gets a full ride to play college baseball. And that's a real disadvantage for us yeah. in that competition. And so, uh, is there any headway being made with the NC2A on that? The, the NC2A is an organization that is in flux, and on a, <laughs> they are. Um, and it sounds it, like you ought to run for president. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting used to this one, you yeah. know. <laughs> I got plenty to do. Um, um, I think that uh, there is flexibility in the NCAA as an organization is, you know, partially because of the pressure it's been under as a result of all the litigation and whatnot. And so I do think that they're looking to be better partners and they feel more flexibility about being partners with a professional sport. One of the reasons that replay worked as well as it did last year is we got tremendous cooperation from the umpires. You know, traditionally they were opposed to replay as a, you know, it undermined their authority, whatever. And, you know, I think, um, their philosophy changed be largely because they got tired of watching their mistakes on ESPN. I, I, and I mean that. I, I'm serious about that. So they were very cooperative in terms of um, yeah. making that change. I had to watch my mistakes on NBC. but <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yes, the, the um, policy change um, that President Obama announced has had an impact um, on our business. Uh, the impact has been quick on the player side because even without a lot of formal change in the regulations, the flow of players out of Cuba has become uh, uh, much more open. Um, it's a great source of talent. Our clubs are really interested in it. Um, where it hasn't really had an effect yet is on the business side because there hasn't been the regulatory change necessary to really allow us to do much from a business perspective.